Dr. Wayne Dyer. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today about uh, sort of the foundation for what I'm going to be speaking about tomorrow as well. Uh, for the last um, several months, I have been over on, uh, at my home on Maui uh, working on a book that is the culmination of uh, a lifetime of writing. It's my 24th book, and um, it could well be the last book I write in these areas. Uh, it's called The Power of Intention. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it's about this, the whole idea of uh, when we uh, have an, an unbending kind of intent in our hearts about something that we want to uh, uh, create and attract into our lives, that it absolutely is impossible for it not to work when we identify ourselves with the whole field of intention from which all of us originated. And it is a very, essentially a very spiritual message. And I will be uh, sharing more about that uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, exactly what intention is and how we can uh, attract virtually anything we want into our lives. As I learned something when I was very, very young, I was the richest kid in the orphanage. I was the only kid that ever had uh, money all the time. And today I'm 62 years old and I still have never made a house payment, nor have I ever made a car payment. <clears throat> and I have purchased 19 homes for various people in my family including everyone in my family and my wife's family and uh, people who work for me um, and my children and my wife's children from her previous marriage and so on. It has been, uh, and it isn't because I'm special, it isn't because I'm more talented, more educated, more brilliant than anybody else. It's because of something that I have always known in my heart. And that is that something that Earl Nightingale, a man who was a great friend of mine and a dear friend, passed away a few years back, put out a tape back in the uh, 40s called The Strangest Secret. And The Strangest Secret is nothing more than these words. We become what we think about all day long. And it sounds almost too simple to be such a great and powerful secret. But the fact is that our thoughts are the things that we use to create our reality. Tomorrow afternoon, I will be speaking about the energy field of which, from which all of us emanate. None of us came here because of our parents' uh, blissful activity in the moment of our conception. We think that that's where we came from, but it's just an illusion, it's just a myth. We come from that place. My teacher in India a few years back was asked a question by one of his devotees, where does everything come from? And his response was, where does your question come from? It is from the same no place, the same place that has no boundaries and no form. And <clears throat> it is that spiritual element that all things emanate from. We become what we think about all day long. I've just published a book not very long ago called There's a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem. And the essence of that book is that when you bring higher and faster energy, which is how energy shows up in the universe, it's either high or low or fast or slow. And higher and faster energy is the energy that nullifies and dissolves lower and slower energy. And even more than nullifying and dissolving it, it converts it into something called love and peace and kindness, and receptivity, and creativity. So that if you are living in a place in your life in which you have shortages, or which you have disease, or which you have disharmony, or struggles at all, and anything that you label a problem, 
if you can somehow learn how to do a somersault into the inconceivable and land in a place where you're looking at a new level of consciousness in which problems are not a possibility for you and that you can attract anything that you want into your life, that there is a source in the universe. Or you can have a different vision. And the vision you can have is of you to be able to attract and, and, and create anything that you want, the power of the mind. One of the great lessons to learn from these kinds of experiences that you'll be having here. So what I'm suggesting is that there is a place within each and every one of us from which all of us can go to where all of us can go. There was a man that I admired very much his name was Herman Melville. Melville was a great American writer back in the 19th century. He wrote Moby Dick and, <clears throat> and many other great uh, pieces of literature and, and much poetry. And he would leave his um, writing space in Western Massachusetts and he would go out into the cornfields and he would lie down on his back and he would see the, in August, he would see the corn as they say in South Pacific, as high as an elephant's eye. I think not South Pacific, whatever that is, Oklahoma, I guess it is. And um, he would imagine that this sea of corn silk, that's all that he could see lying on his back, was the ocean. And, you know, I used to teach Moby Dick when I taught English literature. And <clears throat> a lot of people think that he was just an obsessive old man looking for a whale. But what Moby Dick was really about was the pursuit of that which everyone else considers to be impossible. And the obsessive determination to not allow oneself to be defeated by any forces in the universe. It's a very powerful theme in Melville's life. And as he would lie there on his back, he would look up and this is what he wrote in Moby Dick. For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all of the horrors of the half-lived life. You gotta go to Tahiti. You gotta go to that inner Tahiti, that place of peace and joy, and as I'll be talking about tomorrow, make conscious contact with that source from which you emanated. Because most of us, when we come from that source, most of us, we show up into this world, and in this world, we take on something called an ego. And when we take on this ego, it's really nothing more than just an idea that we carry around about who we are. And we begin to believe in this idea about who we are. And this idea about who we are is something that we run our lives on. And it's really based upon the, <clears throat> the notion that who I am is what I have and who I am is what I do and who I am is what others think of me, my reputation, and who I am is separate from everyone else and who I am is separate from what I would like to attract into my life, that is, from what's missing in my life. Somehow I'm separate from that. That's five. And six, who I am is separate from God, from my source. And those six ideas that we carry around inside of us are the things that destroy our abilities to become manifestors, attractors, of anything that we want to place our attention on.
One of my heroes back in the 1840s was a man named Henry David Thoreau. He had a wonderful definition of success. He went to prison, this man, because he refused to pay his taxes to a government that was doing to the people who had been living on this land for 10,000 years and just removing them in the name of our right to do so because of a piece of legislation signed by President Andrew Jackson in 1830 called the Indian Removal Act. It gave anybody the legal right to just remove people, people who had a language and an educational system and a history of living there. They were just removed. And Thoreau was so anguished by this in Concord, Massachusetts, that he went to prison, refusing to pay his taxes. And his neighbor, his neighbor's name was uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He lived two streets over and seven houses down. Those of you who saw my last PBS special know that I recorded it right there in Concord. And Emerson came to the jail at Concord, and he said to Thoreau, he said, what are you doing in there? We need you out here. He was beginning the transcendentalist movement, some of the ideas of which I'll be speaking about here today and tomorrow. And Thoreau reportedly said to him, Ralph, what are you doing out there? And Emerson paid his bail, and rather than return to his home, he went to live deliberately in the land in a place called Walden Pond out in western Massachusetts. And he wrote an essay on the necessity of civil disobedience. And this is what his definition of success sounded like in that essay. He said, if you advance confidently in the direction of your own dreams and endeavors, an endeavor to live the life which you have imagined, you will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. That's a really powerful definition of success. That you have things inside of you called dreams and endeavors, and if you live by them, rather than chasing after what it is that you think you would like to have, if you live by that connection to your source, because our thoughts are, is the way that God thinks through us. Our thoughts is how God thinks through us. And when our thoughts are in rapport with what it is that spirit is like, which I'll speak about tomorrow, when our thoughts are in harmony with that, everything that the source is capable of doing you are capable of doing. The greatest teacher who ever came to this planet, who ever walked among us 2,000 years ago, reminded us after performing miracles and converting water into wine and ra raising the dead and manifesting the gift of fish and loaves by just his thoughts, the power of his thoughts to attract into our lives whatever it is that he would think about, such was the energy level at which this man lived, this being lived. He said, even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. It's in every one of us. Every one of us has this capacity to do it. The only way you can get past the fact that you're not doing it, that it's not working, that you do have illnesses, that you do have struggles, that you do have addictions, that you do have scarcity in your life in any way is because you have identified with those six components of the ego. When you let go of that and return to your source and become inspirado, in spirit, when you do that, it starts to chase after you. And it's just something that all I can say is that it does. And I stand up here knowing that this is true. See, I know because before I ever showed up here on this planet, I had a conversation with my source, with God. 
And God said, what do you want to do this time around? Because in an infinite world, you get an infinite number of chances at this. And I said, I'd like to teach self-reliance. And God said, you really want to teach self-reliance for a whole lifetime? It's all I've ever done, 62 years later. You sure you want to teach self-reliance? I said, yes, that's exactly what I'd like to do. He said, well, then we better get your little ass into an orphanage. <laughs> and you better spend a good 10 years there. And you better learn how to rely upon yourself. And once you know how to rely upon yourself, you'll be able to teach it. But if you're waiting for somebody else to teach it or you're waiting for the right things to show up, and learning self-reliance was what's the great benefit when people say it must have been a hard time for you as a child. I said, look, when you're six years old, you don't wake up every morning and say, oh, my God, I'm an orphan again today. Why does this happen to me, not everybody else? You don't do that. You get up. And you do whatever you do when you're six. And then you turn 40 a week or two later. Seems like it, doesn't it? <laughs> and then you look at your life and you say, oh my God, I got all of these problems and my wife doesn't understand me and my kids they just think I'm a jerk and I'm addicted to this and I'm poor and I don't have all these bills. Why is that? Someone said, why is your life so messed up? Well, what do you expect from me? You know, I was an orphan, you know. <laughs> well, my mother liked my sister better or Sarah Lee made me fat, or something <laughs> that is back there in our past. We rely upon when, in fact, we are nothing more than the product of the choices that we make. When you move into this, um, this place of inspiration, in 10 Secrets for Success and Inner Peace, uh, the second secret in here, I, what I've done is I've put together, to me, the 10 most important ideas that anyone can master in their lives. And I've tried to raise my children on these ideas and live my life on them. And I've been keeping notes on them for years and years. When I was 19 years old, I was handed a book. And the book was um, a series of short stories. And one of the short stories in there was written by Leo Tolstoy, who in his lifetime was considered to be the most famous person on the planet. 1904, 1905, before radio, before television, before all of the communication, mass communication we have, this man was distributing novels all over the planet. <coughs> Anna Karenina and, uh, and so on. And Tolstoy wrote a, a, a short story. And I, I joined the Navy right after I graduated from high school, went uh, out to California, got on board a, uh, a refrigerator ship called the USS Vega. And I was going to go across the Pacific Ocean to join my ship, which was the USS Ranger, an aircraft carrier, the largest ship in the world at that time. And it was based in uh, Yokosuka, Japan. And we took a uh, ship that took 29 days to get to a place called Sasebo in southern part of Japan, Kyushu. And as I was getting on board this ship to go to my big ship, my uncle, Bill, who was a school teacher in Hayward, California, handed me a copy of this. He said, read this story. It's really important. And I was at 19 years old. And about 10 or 11 days out, I was in my bunk, and uh, it was a little rough. And uh, <clears throat> I picked up this story, and I started reading it. It was about 120, 130 pages. And it was the story of a man in uh, Moscow. His name was uh, Ivan Illich. And Ivan was a uh, judge who hated his life but he was committed to doing things that he had been programmed to do. He was a dancer instead of a choreographer. When I say a dancer, I use the metaphor from a song written by Jackson Brown called For a Dancer. He said, just do the steps that you've been shown by everyone you've ever known until the dance becomes your very own. Into a dancer you have grown from a seed someone else has thrown. Go on ahead and throw some seeds of your own somewhere between the time you arrive and the time you go home. And then the kicker, he said, because in the end, there is one dance you'll do alone. We'll all do it alone. And this was Ivan Illich. He hated his wife, despised her. He 
despised his life, and yet he continued doing what he had been programmed to do. He was a dancer, doing the steps that he'd been shown by everyone he'd ever known, and it had become his own dance, and he was even teaching his own children the same dance, and he despised that about himself. And he got to the end of his life, and he was lying on his deathbed. It's a great metaphor, it's a great picture to have in your own mind. And he was looking up at his wife, and he was holding her hand, and as he was just, and he knew that he was dying. The story is called The Death of Ivan Illich. And he looked up at his wife, and the last words that he said before he died were, what if my whole life has been wrong? And he died. Can you imagine anything more horrible to think? And I always think of that picture when I think of my children saying, do you think I should do this, or do you think I should do that, or should I stay in college because, you know, you got a doctorate, you went to college, and, and will I be disappointing you? One of the things Sky wanted to know, would I be disappointing her if, if she left school? Well, when I was 19 years old, I took out a little notebook, and it was one of the first things I wrote down for this book that I was to write 40 years later. And I wrote a note to myself, it said, Dear Wayne, and I still have it, don't die. with your music still in you. And it became a theme in my life that all of us show up here into this world. We are intended here by a source from which all things are intended. Everything comes from that source. And everything that you needed for this physical journey was in that moment of your conception and even before. But most of us have let go of that dream. Or we don't know how powerful we are. When I was in the third grade, I came home from school, and I said to Mrs. Scarf, which is the lady whose home we lived in, she had 52-some children living in that home. I said, what's a scurvy elephant? She said, a what? I said, a scurvy elephant. She said, where did you hear that? I said, well, I heard Mrs. <coughs> Mrs. Poole, who was my third grade teacher, telling Mrs. Smith, who was the principal, outside of the classroom, that Wayne Dyer was in her classroom and that he was a scurvy elephant. She got on the telephone and she called the principal and the principal said, oh, that's Wayne, he gets everything mixed up. She didn't say that he was a scurvy elephant in her classroom. She said that he was a disturbing element in her classroom. <laughs> and I think you have to understand that becoming a scurvy elephant or a disturbing element is a part of the process of not dying with your music still in you. That there is something that you showed up here to become just like there was something that allowed you to grow into this body that you're in. The same force, the same field of intention that intended you here to be in this body in the shape that it is in, in the size that it is, in the color that it is, in the shape of its eyes, in the color of its hair, whether you have any or don't, whether it falls out or doesn't, all of that. You understand, right? You and I could put our heads together and make an ass of ourselves, right? <laughs> it was all intended here. And also everything that you were to become. And there is a sense inside of you, someplace in a very quiet place, an inner sense, an inner Tahiti, an inner island of peace that knows. You know that you're not this body that you're in. You know where it's going. You know it showed up from nowhere. N-O-W-H-E-R-E. And when it went from nowhere, it showed up in now here. N-O-W-H-E-R-E. -E. It's all the same, just a little question of spacing. So now you're in now here, most of you. And you look around and you look at yourself and you watch your body go through its motions and where the hell do you think it's going? Back to nowhere. From nowhere to now here to nowhere. But while it's here, 
there is something burning inside every one of us. And all we have to do is understand that strangest secret. And the strangest secret is we become what we think about. Our thoughts are the magic elixir. I remember being in that, in that orphanage and a snowstorm would come and there were two snow shovels in the basement of that house. And I took that snow shovel that was downstairs, there were two, one had the edges all curled up and you couldn't make much money with a snow shovel with edges that were curled up. There was another bright, shiny one that Mr. Scarf had made himself. And I used to go down there when it would start snowing and it seemed to snow a lot more in those days than it does today. And I would sleep with that snow shovel. And I would go outside at five o'clock in the morning, wake myself up five, six o'clock in the morning, and I would shovel everybody's walk on Tucker Street, everybody. I didn't ask if it was okay and would you like me to and could I and maybe and so on. I just took the initiative and I went out there and shoveled their snow. And then I went back later that morning with my best little Oliver routine, because I was cute. It may not look like it now, but I was then. Cute little blonde hair and I had little, you know, and I would stand there and I would just tell them that I shoveled your snow for you this morning. And sometimes I get a nickel or a dime I even got a quarter a couple of times. Doesn't sound like much, but that's $4,000 in today's money, okay? Uh, and it wasn't like there was something in here that said this is what you do and you act upon what it is that you feel in here because that thought that you have is something in the Course in Miracles, it says, if you, when I take this microphone to speak, and I'm being introduced as Gary was introducing me, I repeat a line from A Course in Miracles. And the line that I repeat says, if you knew who walked beside you at all times on this path that you have chosen, you could never experience fear or doubt again. You couldn't do it if you had a knowing that you weren't alone. If you knew it, from in here with that burning desire. And it is that connection, it is the ability to go and connect to that. And what I want to move to now is first, what are the obstacles that we have inside of us that keep us from moving into that place within us that allows us to take the snow shovel and just do it? What, do we, what keeps us from doing it? And then I'd like to talk a little bit about a very powerful book that I'd like all of you to read. It's called Power Versus Force. It was written by a very distinguished, brilliant man. I bring it with me to every talk that I give. And I think it's probably the most, well, it is. In fact, I said on the cover of it, let me say exactly how I said it, perhaps the most important and significant book I've read in the past 10 years. And that book and the tapes that I talk about it on called It's Never Crowded Along the Extra Mile are things that I think if you practice it and take it with you that you don't just become surprised by miracles anymore, you become someone who lives them every moment of your life. And there's absolutely no doubt about it. But before you can get to that place, and I'll try to demonstrate a little bit of it, I won't try to, I will demonstrate it for you up here. And then we'll close, and then tomorrow I'll pick up on intention and how we can make that intention our reality virtually every day. If you understand this simple premise, that we become what we think about, as it says in the Torah, as it says in the Old Testament, as a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh, so is he. We are the products of our thoughts. If you get that simple little thing that I started out with and that I hammer in every book I've written and every talk I've given, every tapes I've produced, we are the product of our thoughts. And our thoughts are very, very powerful. See, if your thoughts are on what you intend to manifest into your life, you can't do anything but do that. 
But if your thoughts are on one of these four things, which I would, I would suggest that probably 95, maybe 100% of you have your thoughts on these things. And it's like learning to catch these thoughts, to shift them, and to make them become something that you intend to create or manifest. So here they are. The first thing is, if your thoughts are on what is missing in your life, how much of your time do you spend focused on or thinking about what's missing in your life? The money that you don't have, the unhappiness in your, the lack of happiness in your relationships that you would like to have, your health and uh, the absence of the kind of health that you would like to have, the uh, purity of your body, the, the fact that you've let it become overweight or you've let it become addicted to substances or, or nicotine or uh, coffees or, you know, you're not living uh, the purified life. That you, what is missing? If, you're fo if your thoughts are on what is missing and what you think about is what expands, and there's something, Hawkins speaks about this brilliantly in The Power Versus Four. If your thoughts are on what is missing, what you create is an attractor energy to have the universe respond back to you with whatever it is that you think about. This is how it works. It's, it's a law of attraction. It's a very simple thing. That, remember in that observation of Patanjali, he said, when you become inspired, dormant forces faculties and talents come alive. In other words, there are forces out there, outside of you. There's energy fields outside of you that are capable of joining with you and attracting into your life what you want. Jung call, Carl Jung called it synchronicity. It's a, it's a consciousness in which when you put your thoughts on something, and every one of you have had this experience, the experience of thinking about someone and ha not being able to get your thought off of that person and then going to the telephone and picking it up and saying, oh my God, I was just thinking about you. How many have had that kind of an experience in your life? And you look around and you, you think, well, and what do we attribute that to? We attribute that to what? Coincidence, don't we? We just say, well, that's just, that's just a, a coincidence. It's weird. I don't quite understand it. I'd like to be able to harness it, but it's just weird that it happens. But the word coincidence comes from, a, it's a mathematical term. In, in geometry, two angles that coincide, that's where the word comes from, coincide. Two angles that coincide are two angles that are said to fit together perfectly. That's what an angle that coincides with another angle is. Coincidental ang angles fit together perfectly. We have taken a term that means something that fits together perfectly and we have assigned to it something that accidentally just happens to happen. I'd like to suggest to you that synchronicity, that is the ability to put your thoughts on what it is that you intend to create rather than on what is missing, is a way of attracting what is missing into your life. Now, you can continue to either attract what is missing into your life, or you can continue to, or you can attract what you would like to intend into your life. It's just a matter of shifting the emphasis. If your thoughts are on, if you talk to other people about what is missing, if you, if you use terms like, with my luck, this probably won't work out. I was changing planes in Dallas, flying from Fort Lauderdale to San Francisco. The woman sitting next to me, uh, we came in, we had about 10 minutes to make our connection. And she stood up and she said, as we were gathering our belongings and all of it, everybody was trying to get off the plane, you've all had that experience, and trying to make the connection, she said, with my luck, I won't make my connection. And I thought to myself, why would she have evolved into a person who would project out into the universe, into the world of unlimited energy, why would she project the idea that with her luck things won't work out? Where, where did that come from? Why would we have that kind of an energy uh, concept? Because my response back to her was, well, with my luck, I will make my connection. I intend to make my connection. And she said, you can't make a plane 
that is pulling out stop from pulling out? I said, I absolutely can. Of course I can do that, and I intend to do that. Now, she's still in Dallas. That was like four, four weeks ago, huh? <laughs> trying to get the hell to, uh, uh, you know, her connection to San Francisco. But when you think about what is missing in your life and you talk to your friends about it and you put your attention and your energy on it in your telephone conversations and you go to sleep thinking about what is missing and you have this kind of an energy system going on for you, you will continue to have what you are thinking about show up in your life and you'll see more and more and more of missingness continue to show up. You can't think about and put your energy on what is missing unless you want it to keep being that way in your life. So that's the first thing you want to shift. That's the first obstacle to reaching this state of what I call intention. Secondly, if you put your thoughts on what is, you will continue to attract what is into your life. Now, I'm going to suggest something very strange up here right now. I told you when it gets weird. That you have the ability to put your attention on an inner mantra that I have recorded in a CD called Meditations for Manifesting that came to me from a teacher 2,300 years ago named Patanjali in India who taught people at that time when this is before the Middle Ages, this was like when people hadn't been out of caves too long was teaching people how to levitate, and was teaching people how to bilocate, and was teaching people how to have the gift of fish and loaves 300 years before Jesus showed up on this planet. And his aphorisms of Patanjali are a big part of the spiritual solution to every problem. And what, the, what he suggested at that time is a meditation called Japa. And this meditation is something where you take your attention, your inner energy, off of what is and onto what you intend to manifest, and you repeat the sound that is in the name of God as an inner mantra. And by repeating this sound, you attract the energy from outside of yourself that is the source from which you emanated to cooperate with you and literally collaborate with you to shift it into whatever it is that you intend to manifest. And you can do this with money. You can do this with uh, getting pregnant if you haven't been able to do that. You can get it with uh, selling your home. You can get it. And if you take a look at 300 years later, 400 years later, um, John the Baptist uh, writes in the New Testament the opening line of the New Test of the of, of the book of John in the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As strange as it may sound to you, based upon the conditioning that you have had, just like Ivan Illich. The repetition of the sound as an inner mantra is a way of getting in the gap. And it is a way of when you repeat this sound, attracting whatever energy, that dormant forces that are out there, into your life to have whatever you need show up. And all I can say to you is, I stand up here before you tonight from my heart telling you that it has always worked for me. It is a meditation practice. It is so powerful, and I can't tell you how many people have been practicing it, including Gary, who spoke to you here today. And there is absolutely no limit to what you can attract into your life simply by practicing it. I have put it on CD. I've put it in Getting in the Gap. I teach it. I, I donate all of the proceeds from it to charities because I was asked to teach it but to take no money for it. And I've been doing it for, for several years now. If your thoughts are on what is, let's just say you've got a disease process. Cancer, arthritis, the flu, a cold, 
if your thoughts are on, if you get a sniffle and your thoughts are on, this is in my nose today, but tomorrow it'll be in my throat. On Wednesday, <clears throat> it'll be down in my chest. On Thursday, I'll probably have a fever. I'm going to have to take Friday off. Now, it's Monday morning, and you've got a sniffle, and in your mind, you're taking Friday off with a fever. If this is how you have trained your mind to work, to put your attention on the circumstances of your life, self-actualizing people, Abraham Maslow was a great teacher of mine. I was blessed to know him. I was blessed to be one of his uh, devotees. He died on the 14th of June, 1970, in the same hour that I walked across the stage at Cobo Hall in Detroit receiving my PhD, in the same hour. He passed the baton on. He said, I've taught self-actualization to the academic world. Now you take it to the masses. And Maslow said, self-actualizing people are distinguished from everybody else with this sentence. They must be what they can be. They must be what they can be. And one of those 10 secrets for success and inner peace is that you can't solve a problem with the same mind that created it. And know this, that your mind created everything in your life that you call a problem. And self-actualizing, highly functioning people who live at these extremely, extraordinarily high levels of consciousness never put their thoughts on what is if they don't like what is. Because if your thoughts are on what is and you despise what is, and if you look at poor people, if you look at unsuccessful people, if you look at sickly people, if you look at tired people, if you look at addicted people, you will, be, you will see people who put their attention constantly on their problems, on what is wrong, on what isn't working, on what I can't do, and so on. They'll tell you about it, they'll focus on it, and when you think, when your thoughts are on what is, and what you think about is what expands, you continue to attract more of what is into your life. When I had a practice, I had a woman who came to me who said, I have been, I just went through a divorce seven months ago, and I've been dating, and I've dated four different men, and all four of them have used me as a sex object. And every single one of them called me up after the first date and uh, you know, t were mistreating me, and they didn't have any respect for me, and that was the end of it. And she said, I'd like to, you to talk to all four of these men. And I said, there's only one common denominator here. You are attracting into your life what you are putting your attention on. It's called the Job effect. You can't think about what, what is missing, and you can't think and put your energy and talk about what is if you don't like what is. Can't do that, unless you want more of that to show up. Third, you cannot put your attention or your thoughts or your energy on what always has been. If you put your thoughts or your energy on what always has been, what always has been is what will continue to show up into your life. What always has been is the wake of a boat. Your life is a boat. It's heading up the river at that, in that direction. And it's heading there at 40 knots and you're standing on the stern, and you're looking down at the water, and as the boat goes in this direction, here you are looking down into the water, and what do you see? You see the wake. And what is the wake? The wake is the trail that is left behind. That's what the wake of your life is. That's what the wake of the boat is. And if you ask yourself the question, what's driving the boat? What's making this thing head in this direction? The answer is, the present moment energy that is being generated by the engine and nothing more is what's making the boat go in this direction. And then if you ask yourself this key question, is it possible for the wake to drive the boat? Can a trail that is left behind make a boat go in this direction? What's the answer? Impossible isn't it? And so too is it impossible for the wake of your life, the trail that you've left behind, to be the reason why your life is going in this direction. It is not because of anything that has happened back here. That's an illusion that we live under. What has happened back here is a trail. 
the choices you make in this moment. And if your thoughts are on what always has been, this is the way we've always done things, this is the kind of person I am, I can't change, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, all of those cliches that have become so much a part of our life, if your thoughts are on what always has been and you despise what always has been, you will continue to attract more of what always has been even though you despise it. It works that way. So you can't think about what's missing, what is, and what always has been. And it gets worse. <laughs> you cannot think about and put your attention on what they want or expect for you if you want that to change in your life. And there's no shortage of people who have an opinion about what it is that you should be or shouldn't be or how you should be doing it. Most of these are your relatives. I have a wonderful book in mind to write. It's called Your Friends Are God's Way of Apologizing for Your Relatives. <laughs> but if I talk to your relatives, they laugh too. So <laughs> we all have this idea that the reason I'm not getting where I'd like to be, particularly with young people and working with young people over the years, it's because my parents want this and my parents think that and my parents won't let me do this and because... And I always say, well, but why are you so attached to what your parents think? Well, these are my parents, and I have to do it. I said, you, don't ha you can listen to it. You can take it in, but you, you don't have to embrace it. You don't have to follow by, live by that. And certainly, when you become adults, when you, you know, if, if there are people out there who, who convince you that you should or shouldn't be doing this or that, then you're going to continue to attract exactly what it is that they have their attention on. So if you put your thoughts on what they want for you, you tell everybody else about how, how it, it makes you go from being blissed to pissed just by being in their presence, just by being on the telephone with them, that person, that in-law, that mother, that father, that grandparent, that child, that uh, it, whoever it might be, is giving you, or even your neighbors or your friends or whomever, your coworkers are telling you what you should or shouldn't be and you don't like the advice that they're giving and you resent very strongly, one of the 10 secrets for success in the inner peace says there are no justified resentments. Your resentments are things that destroy you. So if your thoughts are on what they want for you and what they want for you is something you don't like, you will continue to attract more of and use the attractor energy of the universe to attract more of what they want for you even though you are upset about it. So here you go. There are four things that you can't do with your mind if you want to move into this state of intention that I'll be speaking about tomorrow. And these are, you cannot put your thoughts on what's missing, on the circumstances of your life, on what you always have been, or what others want for you. So you have to learn to do a somersault into the inconceivable and only put your thoughts or your attention on what you intend to manifest for yourself. I'd like to suggest to you that what you have to do is learn how to do that thing called the inconceivable. And I'd like to s s just do a little demonstration with you. I just, uh, maybe I could ask someone, this lady's been so nice, and would you mind coming up? Could you, do you know what I'm gonna do? Good, come on up, that's even better. Are you taping? Are you taping this? So maybe uh, someone um, could. Would you mind coming up, sir, and just helping me out for a moment? Anyone? Yeah, that'd be great. Hi. And uh, what I'm going to do, just for a moment, is I'm going to demonstrate something called energy that I'll be talking a little bit more tomorrow. But I promised it tonight, so I'd like to do it. And then Sky is going to close out with a beautiful song from her CD. <coughs> Every thought that you have is an energy. Everything in the universe is an energy. And when you have a thought that is a thought that weakens you, which Hawkins speaks about so brilliantly in Power Versus Force, that thought, the tenth secret in Ten Secrets says, wisdom is avoiding all thoughts which weaken you. And thoughts change and make you strong or weak depending upon whether or not what you're thinking at any given moment. And I'd like to demonstrate that. So if you could just come over here, stand right here. And sir, if you'll come back over here, um, I'm, I'm just, all I need, yeah, all I need you to do is hold the mic because we're taping. Otherwise, I would just do that, okay? So 
It's a, this is a tough job, but when I speak, it goes here. When she speaks, it goes here. Okay. Now, um, what is your name? Linda. Linda what? Linda LaCour. Linda LaCour. Sounds like a stripper. I no, no. <laughs> you've, you've heard that before, right? <laughs> yes, right. You look like one, too. A pretty nice one. Yeah, right. All right, Linda LaCour. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to... That's it. I would like you to um, understand that this body that you came into this world with is perfect. And it came from something called truth. Spirit is truth. Okay? And it cannot distinguish a lie. It cannot react to a lie. You can in your mind because the mind is the ego. Okay? But your body can only respond to truth. Okay? And any thought that you have that is not of the truth of God will weaken you, okay? So I'd like you to take this arm, and I'd like you to extend it out, and I'd like you to make a fist. You don't have a watch on you, right? Okay, and I'd like you to keep that wrist st strong. I'm gonna take these two fingers, and I'd like you to, again, give me your name. Linda LaCour. And is that the truth? That is the truth. Okay, say, it, say it just like that. My name is Linda LaCour, and that is the truth. My name is Linda LaCour, and that is the truth. Hold on to that thought as hard as you can, okay? And resist me as hard as you can. Resist. I'm going to push down. I want you to resist. Would you say I'm putting a lot of pressure on? Strong? Very strong. Okay. Relax for a minute. Now I'd like you to lie to me. You have, you'll be forgiven. I have, I, have, I have connections here, okay? I'd like you to um, make up a name. But if I ask you if it's the truth, I want you to just say yes, okay? That's all. Simple little lie. What is your name? Alice Klemchik. She was a stripper, too. <laughs> okay. Your name is? Alice? Alice Klemchik. Okay. And is that the truth? <laughs> My name is Alice Klemchik, and that is the truth. So you're telling me the truth? Yes, that is the truth. Okay. Make a fist. Resist me as hard as you can, and again, make that statement. Okay. My name is Alice Klemchik, and that is the truth. Okay. So you're telling me the truth. Okay. Now I'd like you to keep that thought in mind. That's very important and resist me as hard as you can and see if there's any difference. Okay, can you notice the difference? Okay, give me your real name. My name is Linda LaCour. And? And that is the truth. Resist me as hard as you can. Now tell me a lie. What is your name? My name is Alice Klemchik, and that is the truth. You're telling me the truth. That is the truth. Okay, resist me as hard as you can. Okay. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Are you shocked? <laughs> okay, now wait. Now wait. Don't go away yet. The body can only react to truth because the body is, that's the mind that can make it weak. When I do this with my children, they bring their friends over and say, ask her if she ever smoked marijuana, Dad. Okay? <laughs> In power versus force, how this works. But I want to go a little bit further with this. I'd like you to think of a moment in your life when you experienced pure love. Child husband easy you know what it is you don't have to share what it is okay if you what is your name sir glenn glenn hasty are you telling the truth yes. uh, yeah okay all right. you have great teeth glenn <laughs> all right uh, glenn will you hold this for me okay i would like you to make your fist okay resist me as hard as you can and think of that moment in your life a moment in your life when you felt pure unconditional blissful love okay keep that thought in mind and resist me as hard as you can and Notice how hard I'm pushing and how strong you are, okay? Now, I'd like you to go in your thoughts, without sharing what it is, mm -hmm. to a moment in your life when you felt ashamed. Can you think of a moment like that? Okay, any time, all right? Don't share it, whatever. All right, go break a fist. Resist me as hard as you can, and what are you thinking? You are... Okay, resist me as hard as you can and hold on to that thought and resist and notice that you have no strength at all. Resist hard as you can. Shame, resist me as hard as you can and notice that you have no strength in your arm at all. Shame is the lowest energy. Don't go away yet. Shame is the lowest energy and when you have a thought and when you use shame on yourself, on your children, on your coworkers, on anyone, when you think a thought of shame, you weaken every muscle in the body. Now, it isn't just thoughts that have energy. Everything has energy. My son was listening this summer to a CD in which the person on the, on the, on the machine 
was swearing, using foul language, and encouraging people to hate each other and to kill each other and even to have sex with their sisters. And I was just a, a and I said, Sans, what is this? And he said, oh, Dad, this is really cool. This is I said, bring that CD to me. And he brought the CD in, and I said, now, I want to do a little test with you. And he's seen me do this. We do this at the house all the time. And, I, and now he's, a, he's about my height. He's about six foot. I'm six one. He's a little shorter, but he's big, strong, very strong kid. And I said, take this banana. And I had him hold the banana next to his heart. And I had him put his arm out. And I said, now, resist me. And I, I couldn't budge his arm. I said, now, take this CD. The energy of the music is in the CD. And I had him hold it there. And with one finger, I was able to push his arm down. That the music we listen to, that's why I asked Sky when she made her CD to put words and music on there that will strengthen rather than weaken, and she has done that. But I'd like to just do a little experiment here with you. I'd like you to take her CD. I've never done this before. Okay, just hold it. And I'd like you to put this in this hand, and I'd like you to push that, the energy of that, into your solar plexus, into your heart, and take this, Glenn, and make a fist, and I'd like you to resist me as hard as you can. Resist as hard as you can. And what would you say? Am I putting a lot of pressure on? Yes, you are. Okay, now I brought, just set this down, because this okay. is a very high area. Now. You have no idea what's in this envelope. Okay. I'd like you to um, take this envelope, mm -hmm. and I'd like you to just push that into your heart, okay? Just the energy of that, whatever it is, okay? And I'd like you to make a fist, and I'd like you to resist me as hard as you can, okay? Resist as hard as you can, and notice what is happening to your arm. What do you think that is? Marijuana. <laughs> that makes you strong, baby. <laughs> you can check into hotels with that. Linda LaCour. Na, 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 na. <laughs> this is... <clears throat> this is aspartame. And in Power versus Poor, this is sweet and low. And every time you use an artificial substance, you weaken every muscle in your body. It all, 1,000 out of 1,000 times you'll find it. It's, it's astonishing. One more thing, and that's something to set it over there. I'd like you to um, think of someone that symbolizes for you high spiritual, highest spiritual principles. Buddha, Jesus, Mother Teresa, Swami, Wami, wh whatever it might be. And who would that be? Jesus. Okay, for you it would be Jesus. Okay. I'd like you to, you know, you have a picture of what Jesus might look like in your mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just get the picture of Jesus. Put your, Jesus is the, is the highest calibrated individual who ever walked on this planet, according to Hawkins in Power Versus Force. And The Eye of the Eye, which is his follow-up book, which is something I encourage you to read as well. Very astonishing. Here we go. Okay, get a picture of Jesus in your mind and resist me as hard as you can. Resist as hard as you can. And am I putting a lot of pressure on? This is so easy. Right, okay. Because I've got Jesus in my heart. Okay. It's so now I'd like you to change your picture of Jesus and I'd like you to think of someone that symbolizes evil. Okay. An Adolf Hitler, mm -hmm. okay, a Charles Manson, uh, an Osama bin Laden, if that, whatever it is. Can you think of someone that symbolizes that for you? Sure. Okay, who would that be? Hitler, Hitler, who symbolizes hatred and putting people in ovens and holocausts and final solutions and all that. Just get a picture of Hitler in your mind, what he looks like, that's all. Just a, just a portrait in your mind. Mm -hmm. Resist me as hard as you can. Don't fake it, okay? Yeah. Resist as hard as you can and notice what is happening yeah. to you. So you see the difference? Yeah. The instant that you put a thought, that's great. Thank you both very much. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to stop in a few moments. The instant that you put a thought a thought of hatred, a thought of shame. The instant that you put something into your body and hold it close to it, the moment that you move into the energy field of someone who is negative, and I'll be speaking more about this tomorrow afternoon and doing a little bit more of, of demonstration on it, that everything in this universe is an energy. I have the prayer of St. Francis, on a, uh, which I'll re be reciting tomorrow, and Sky will sing for you tomorrow, on a... Uh, on a card that is uh, produced by a woman who lives in a wheelchair. Then also, and, we, and all it takes is to have, to be in the energy field. If I had, if I had Linda hold this um, up next to her, it would strengthen her. Just the words. 
Energy is in everything. And here's one of the most powerful notions about how you move into this area of bringing higher energy to the presence of lower energy in your life to strengthen rather than weaken you. It was on the wall of the ashram where Mother Teresa lived. And it goes like this. If you want to know tonight what to do and what to think and how to bring this energy to you, listen to these words. And put these, as I said, the, the money that's collected on these goes to a woman who lives in a wheelchair who has the intention to not be dependent. And you stick this on there and you, and you know, your children just have to walk by these words. And the energy, it touches and impacts them. Just like the music, the CD, even carrying it around. It's why I knew that Sky's CD would strengthen rather than weaken you. You can take the prayer of St. Francis, which she sings on there, put that on your, in your car and play it in a moment of frustration or anguish in, a, in, in traffic. And you know what? You can move the traffic. I know you laugh and you think that that kind of thing is impossible. There is nothing that you can't do when you shift your energy from energies that weaken to energies that strengthen. And this is what Kent Keith had written and what Mother Teresa lived by. She said, people are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone may destroy overnight. That's particularly relevant in America, isn't it? Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you have anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it's all between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway.